welcome everyone to the first video in our unit on linear algebra. In this video, we'll be talking about using matrices to solve systems of linear equations. First, we'll look at what matrix transformations are doing to the systems graphically, and then we'll look at some algorithms to solve them. Imagine I have a system of linear equations that I want to solve. For this example, let's assume they are x plus 2y is equal to 5 and 2x minus 3y is equal to 3. Graphically, I'm looking at two lines and I want to find their intersection. Normally to solve this system, I just do some algebra to it to isolate the x and the y terms. This is equivalent to solving the matrix equation 1, 2, 2, minus 3, acting on the column vector x, y is equal to the column vector 5, 3. I'm going to show you that every step of the algebra actually corresponds to a linear transformation of the plane that we can use to solve our system of equations. If you aren't familiar with the idea of linear transformations, there's a great video by 3Blue1Brown I'll link to below. Let's start with this coordinate system. This is in the basis of the matrix of coefficients. Here, the x and y vectors from the system of equations are given by the column vectors x equals 1, 2, and y equals 2, minus 3. What we're looking for is a matrix transformation that maps these initial vectors into a basis where x equals 1, 0, and y equals 0, 1. This also maps the vector 5, 3 into the solution. So let's see how it works. First off, we want to eliminate the x term from the second linear equation. We can do this by multiplying the first equation by minus 2 and adding that to the second equation. This gives us a new equation, minus 7y is equal to minus 7. In terms of matrices, this corresponds to the matrix 1, 0, minus 2, 1, acting on both sides of our matrix equation. This transforms our x vector to 1, 0, and our y vector to 2, minus 7. Likewise, our solution vector gets mapped to 5, minus 7. Our second step is solving for y by dividing both sides of the third equation by minus 7. In matrix form, this corresponds to dividing the second row by minus 7. This matrix transformation corresponds to shrinking the y direction by a factor of 7. Our new x vector doesn't change because its y component is already 0. The y component of the y and solution vectors are both minus 7, so the y vector becomes 2, 1, and the solution vector becomes 5, 1. The third step is now eliminating y from the first equation by multiplying the y equals 1 equation by minus 2 and adding it to the first equation. This corresponds to the matrix 1, minus 2, 0, 1, acting on our transformation matrix 1, 0, minus 2 sevenths, 1 seventh. And we get the final transformation matrix 3 sevenths, 2 sevenths, 2 sevenths, minus 1 seventh. This transforms the y vector to 0, 1, and the solution vector to 3, 1. What we've actually done by converting our algebra steps into matrix transformations is solve for the inverse of the original coefficient matrix, 1, 2, 2, minus 3. This transforms the coefficient matrix into the identity matrix. Now let's have a more systematic look at how we constructed the inverse matrix. This is a procedure called Gauss-Jordan elimination. Imagine we have a system of equations to solve. For example, 2x plus y plus z equals 1, 4x plus 5y plus 2z equals 2, and 2x minus 2y equals 2. We can write this as a matrix equation again, where m is the matrix of coefficients, a is the vector x, y, z, and b is the vector 1, 2, 2. The matrix transformation we did was construct a matrix A that transformed the initial matrix of coefficients into the identity and the B vector into the solution for this system of equations. So effectively, we're not solving the specific system of equations, but we're looking for a matrix A that when multiplied by M generates the identity matrix. We can do this by doing operations on each row of the matrix M and seeing what the same operations do to the identity matrix. Gauss-Jordan elimination is split into two parts, the first being Gaussian elimination, which can be done to any matrix, and the second part is back substitution, which, as we'll see, can only be performed on certain matrices. 
In Gaussian elimination, our goal is to eliminate, or set to zero, the first value of the second two rows of m, and the second value from the third row, and so on. More generally, we want the first ith entries of the i plus oneth row to be zero. We'll start by eliminating the first value of the second row, 4, from this matrix. We can do that by multiplying row 1 by minus 2 and adding it to row 2. That gives us a new row 2 equal to 0, 3, 0. When I do this to the identity, row 2 becomes minus 2, 1, 0. We'll repeat this for row 3. Now I subtract the first row from the third, which gives me new third rows 0, minus 3, 1, and minus 1, 0, 1. In general, I multiply the first row by minus the first entry of the nth row, so a n 1, divided by the first entry of the first row, a 1, 1, and add that to the nth row. Next, I want to repeat this procedure for the submatrix, 3, 0, minus 3, minus 1. I want to eliminate the second entry from the third column, so I want to use the second row of the matrix to do this. In this case, I add the new second row to the third row, which gives me 0, 0, minus 1 on the left and minus 3, 1, 1 on the right. More generally, I would be multiplying the new row 2 by minus the second entry of the nth row, so bn2, divided by the second entry from the second row, and adding it to the new nth row. Note, however, that if the second entry of the second line were 0, I'd be dividing by 0 and would need to look to another row to eliminate the second entry of the rest of the rows. That's sufficient for this 3 by 3 matrix, but I could continue to repeat this procedure for larger matrices. Doing this algorithmically, it makes sense to treat each submatrix on its own. I could replace the b values by the ones from step 1, and you can see how messy this becomes. We're done with Gaussian elimination when the matrix is in what we call row echelon form. A matrix is in row echelon form 1. The leading coefficient, called the pivot, of a non-zero row is always strictly to the right of the leading coefficient of the row above it. And 2. All rows containing all zeros are at the bottom. Gaussian elimination can put any matrix into row echelon form. You could prove this as an exercise for yourself. Putting a matrix in row echelon form gives us a lot of information about it, particularly if we're thinking about solving a system of linear equations. The rank of a matrix is the number of pivots it has. Consider the equation ma equals b, where m is an m by n matrix, and b and a are m by 1 matrices. ma plus b is considered consistent if and only if the rank of m is equal to the rank of the augmented matrix mb. We can use this to tell us about the number of solutions ma equals b has. If the rank of M is equal to the rank of the augmented matrix, MB, and both are equal to the number of columns in M, then the system, MA equals B, has one unique solution. If the rank of M is equal to the rank of the augmented matrix, MB, which is less than the total number of columns, then the system, MA equals B, has infinitely many solutions. If the rank of M does not equal the rank of MB, then there are no solutions to the system. If M is square and all pivots are non-zero, then we can continue with our algorithm to invert M, the second part of which we call back substitution. I've chosen to break it up into two separate steps here, but they can easily combine into one step for a slightly faster algorithm. The first step is dividing each row by the value of its pivot. So that's 2 for row 1, 3 for row 2, and minus 1 for row 3. That makes all entries along the matrix diagonal equal to 1. When I do this to the identity matrix, I end up with 1 half 0, 0, minus 2 thirds, 1 third, 0, 3, minus 1, 1. Next, we start at the last row and eliminate the last entry from the next to last row. Here, it's already 0, so we don't need to do anything. Then we move up to the third row from the bottom, which happens to be our first row, and multiply its second coefficient by the second row and its third coefficient by the third row, and subtract them from the row in question. In our case, this amounts to dividing both rows 2 and 3 by minus 2 and then adding them to row 1. Now the left matrix is an identity matrix. On the right, when I repeat this step, I end up with minus 2 thirds, 1 third, 1 half, 
minus two thirds, one third, zero, and three minus one, minus one. In general, I replace row i by row i minus the sum on j from j equals n minus i to n of d i j times rho j. And this completes the algorithm for Gauss-Jordan elimination. This has converted the matrix on the left to the identity and the matrix on the right to the inverse of m.